so this is the first lecture so it will be mostly introductory but we will begin in right earnest you know i mean we'll we'll just start you'll see the pace pace at which it goes uh, that will also help you uh, understand the rigor in this course okay so uh, to begin with error control codes are part of digital communication systems right so how does a digital communication system look like communication system Okay, so you have various ways of drawing this picture. You go and talk to a field engineer or an analog engineer or a, someone, someone who builds systems. He'll, he'll draw you several blocks. Okay, starting from all kinds of things to timing recovery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so I'm going to draw the box that is used by error con people who do coding theory. Okay, well, there are several boxes. The box that we'll pick is something extremely simple. I'll say bits are going in. Okay, and then I have a box. Okay, and out of that box, what comes out? Bits. Okay, so that's my beautiful digital communication system. Okay, there's absolutely no information here. I'm going to call everything that's in between as a channel. Okay, so we'll work with this simple black box to begin with. Okay, we'll as as we go along in the course, we'll change this. We'll go deep into this into this, not very deep, but at least dig into this channel a little bit. And do something better. Okay, but for starting off, we'll start off with this very simple, simple looking picture where everything that happens to a bit as it goes through a digital communication system and it's received at the other end is just one box and you get a bit out. Okay, and we'll in fact take a very simple uh, simple model for that box. We'll simply say it's what's called a <coughs> what do you think I'm gonna say now? It's gonna be a binary symmetric channel. Okay, so I'll say it's a binary symmetric channel. Okay, what does this do? It's very simple. It takes a zero, <coughs> okay, and maps it to a zero or a one, and it takes a one and maps it to a one or a zero. Okay, and there are probabilities for these things. Zero will become a zero with probability p, one minus p. I'm sorry, one will become a one with probability one minus p. And a transition or a wrong or an error will happen with probability p. Okay, it's a very simple model. Okay, so that's a uh, that's that's where we're going to start. We're going to say anything that happens to the bit looks like this. Okay, if you transmit it as zero, you'll receive a one with probability what p. If you transmit it a one, you'll receive a zero with probability p. Everything is symmetric whether you do zero or one. And channel is of course binary. And there'll be another assumption: each bit, what what happens to each bit is independent of whatever happened to any other bit. Okay, that's just an implied assumption. I'm not going to write it down or make make it more precise. I'm going to say each bit goes through an independent version of this channel. Okay, it's all uh, probability p. <coughs> okay, I think you must have seen this before. This is a very simple channel to deal with. Okay, so so what is the goal when you design a digital communication system? What is the goal? What would you what would you like this P to be? Wow, people are giving wonderful engineering answers. What's the ideal value for P? Zero. Okay, okay, but whatever you do, you'll never get P equals zero. Okay, and in many cases, it's very bad to just design a communication system to optimize this P for one bit to go down to a very very low value. Okay, so if you try that, you will see later on also maybe we will prove it, but not, not to any great extent. You It will turn out that you will need a lot of power in the transmitter to drive this P to 0. Okay, so it is not a very smart thing to do. It is not a very efficient thing to do. Okay, so that is the first uh, remark that you should have learnt from digital communication. Okay, uh, uh, not efficient to drive P to 0. Okay, so roughly if you remember from your uh, digital communications, what kind of SNR do you need on an AWGN channel to drive the speed to zero, close to zero? Okay, it depends on the transmitting constellation. So suppose I say BPSK. Okay, what kind of SNR do you need for 10 power minus 6 BER on a 
AWGN channel with BPSK. Okay, so that's what you should have learnt in digital communication, right? So roughly the number will come to 11 dB or something like that, some such number. Okay, some 11 dB, 10 dB. Okay, so it's very large. <coughs> what is the? But there is some theory which says it's enough if you have what? What kind of SNR do you need for sending one bit across without error? From information theory, you can learn that it's just 1 dB or so. Okay, so you have a 10 dB gap between what you need raw power in BPSK and what is actually possible from information theoretic notions. Okay, if you're, if you're not familiar with this, but at least at least know that that's possible. Okay, so it's possible to use much lower power to get close to zero probability of error as opposed to very large power. Okay, so that's where that's the role that coding plays in digital communication systems. It can try to reduce this p in an indirect way. What do you do? You don't try to reduce this p, but you do something else, right? That's where coding comes. In. <coughs> okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to try and do coding in this digital communication system. Okay, so I'll say efficient answer is provided by error control codes. Efficient solution you have to use coding. Okay, so so people knew that you had to do coding more than 50 years back. Okay, and currently I think the theory has developed to a stage where people also know what the best way what the best way of doing coding is also. So one can say in, in many ways that the problem has been solved. Okay, initially 50 years back people didn't know how to do coding. Now you pretty much know what you have to do. Okay, so that's uh, that's the interesting take here. All right, so now. So how does the system look with coding? Okay, suppose you look at coding. This is what you would do. Instead of sending one bit at a time into this channel, you would collect some k bits. Okay, and then you would do something to it. Okay, I'm going to call it encoding. Okay, I'll call an encoder. I'll put an encoder here, and out of the encoder comes n bits. Okay, and I'm going to let n be greater than k. Okay. Okay. So we'll come back to this box soon enough, but let me complete this whole picture. Then after this, you have a binary symmetric channel, say with probability p. And then out of this comes what? When n bits go into this BSE, what would come out? N bits again. Okay. Not necessarily the same n bits that you transmit and depending on n that will almost always happen it will never be the same okay and now one can presume that you can do something which we call which we assign which we call decoding to get your say k bits back okay one can loosely say this is what happens okay so this is how you would actually do coding across the digital communication system that I had for you before. Okay, a very simple <coughs> basic way of looking at it. Okay. So what has happened here? Several things have happened. Okay. So we have to look at it very closely. Let's begin with the encoding. Okay. So it's a very simple thing to look at the encoding. Okay. So uh, this is called the message. This set of k bits is called the message. After encoding, you get what's called a code word. Okay, after the channel, you get what's called a received word. After the decoder, you get what's called the decoded message. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write down what type of values each of these things can take. Okay, so I'm going to use some pseudo mathematical notation. Hopefully, you'll follow it, it will be very important. Okay, what values can the message take? So typically you assume all messages are possible, right? If you say k bits, the message is coming out of some source, you assume the source has got good entropy, etc. And all, all messages are possible. So if I say k bits, then I'll have to plan for the message being any one of 2 power k possible <coughs> binary sequences. So I'm going to say the message belongs to, okay, I'll use this notation, 0, 1, what can I write? To the power k. Okay, so this will be a notation for what? What does this notation stand for? Okay, all binary 
sequences of length k. Right? Okay. Okay, suppose instead of 0, 1, if I put 0, 1, 2 to the power k, what does this mean? Alternary sequence. This is simple notation. Okay, so that's fine. All right. So what about the code word now? Okay, now I have to say a few more things about the encoder. Okay, I'm going to say now my encoder is a <coughs> is a one to one map. Okay, I'm going to say that next. Okay, so if, once I say that, once I say my encoder is one to one, what do I know about the code words? What kind of values will the code words take? Okay. Exactly. So that's the difference between the message and the code word, right? So you have message belonging to 0, 1 to the power k, code word belonging to 0, 1 power n, but what's the difference? All n bit sequences are not possible as code words, cannot be code words. Why? Because I said the encoder was a one to one map, okay? Which means there are only 2 power k possible inputs, obviously only 2 power k possible code words must be there, okay? So you should note that, okay? So set of all messages here equals 0, 1, k, set of all code words here will not equal 0, 1, n, it will be some subset of 0, 1, n, okay? it's a very simple idea. Okay. Let us move over to the other side, the received word side. Okay. Once again, I can definitely say this, am I right? But what will be the distinction between the code words and the received words? Now? All are possible, even if you say only 2 pa k code words were transmitted, right all received words are possible according to my channel model in fact if i only transmit one vector right with positive probability every vector in 0 1 n is definitely possible right all those branches are possible every bit can be in error or not be in error right so you'll get all the possibilities with non zero probability okay so that's the next thing to keep in mind so what is the task of the decoder now Okay, suppose the channel was not there, what would the decoder do? Suppose I knew the channel did not introduce any error, what would the decoder do? Exactly. So this encoder did a one to one map, it would do a inverse of that map. You know it is a one to one map, so there is a inverse. But what has happened from message to received word? Is that a one to one map? Clearly not, right? So even though the code word was a one to one, from code word to received word it became a one to many map. Actually, in fact, it became a probabilistic map, right? So you don't know exactly which was which it went to. Okay. So obviously, the decoder cannot do the inverse of this map. It has to do something more. Okay. And it will turn out clearly that decoder can never be always successful with this model. Right? Decoder will definitely make an error. Right? So our objective will be what? To minimize that error. Okay. <coughs> objective in designing the decoder will be minimize, try to minimize, well, we will do it in various ways, probability that decoded message is not equal to transmitted message. Okay, so that is the first point to keep in mind. You can never have a decoder which will make which will have zero probability of error over the binary symmetry channel. Obviously, it will have an error. <coughs> okay. So, to begin with in, in this course, we will we'll still insist the decoder will be a proper function. Okay. So, what it will do is, if you give a certain received word, obviously, it should give a certain message. Okay. That map will be there. So, the decoder becomes actually a many to one map. Okay. <coughs> okay. So if I want to be more precise, okay. So if I want to be much more precise about exactly what this map is, right? So if I want to be more specific, I should exactly do what? I should specify what the encoder map is and what the decoder map is, right? Suppose there is an engineer who wants to write a C program to implement your wonderful digital communication system with an error control code, what should you give him? You should give him the one to one map at the encoder and the many to one map at the receiver. Okay, <coughs> You have to do that. Okay, Hopefully, you have designed all that very carefully and your probability of error is very low. Okay, 
so that's the that's the overall picture so in this course <coughs> we'll see basically the design of the encoder and decoder okay first of all why is the design of the encoder a non trivial problem okay there should be various possibilities right when when, when do you have a non trivial design problem when there are millions of possibilities and you have to pick one among them right that's when the design problem becomes very non trivial so let me see how, 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 how quickly you can count okay how many possibilities are there for the encoder for a given k and n okay okay do people agree with that answer how many how many different mappings are there i mean it needs to be it needs to be a one to one map right right so i have 2 power k code words to select from 2 power n possibilities and how many ways can i do that 2 power n c 2 power k you might say okay well it's two. well yeah maybe one can argue that the order will not matter for for the probability of error etc maybe maybe one can argue the order will not matter okay so but the absolute code words also actually they won't matter several of them you can throw out but <laughs> let's just say 2 power n p 2 power k if you want to be very precise okay so it's a you might say okay it's only 2 maybe it's a small number but eventually you'll see you'll have to push this n and k to be very large numbers you'll have to pick k equals thousands okay then n becomes also greater than a thousand right so if you do 2 power 2000 choose 2 power 1000 what do you think you'll get okay you'll get numbers which are astronomically huge more than astronomically huge. You, can't, you can't deal with them okay so out of all those possibilities for the encoders you will learn in this course how to pick that encoder which will minimize the probability of error okay isn't that amazing right that's the way to think about it okay so the design issue here is selection of encoder first okay okay so that seems to be the obvious design question but let's dig a little deeper here okay <clears throat> i'm going to argue the encoder itself does not matter only the list of code words matter <coughs> okay the same question about this ordering that people asked okay the encoder is what is the map from message to the code word but look at what's happening the message to the code word map is very can be arbitrary i can assign any message i want to any code word what is received is actually what is received when the code word is transmitted and not when the message is transmitted okay it doesn't really matter what what mapping i do we'll make that argument more precise as we go along but you'll see actually the selection of the list of code words is the real problem and not necessarily the selection of the encoder okay in practice the encoder is also very important the guy has to write a c program right if you give him a list of two part 1000 table and then ask him to write it down he's not going to be able to write it so this, the selection of the encoder is also crucial in practice but in theory to minimize the probability of error what's interesting is the list of code words and not necessarily the mapping from the message to the code word okay so you'll see but but the encoder is very crucial <coughs> okay and then okay encoder okay well encoder itself is a non trivial enough problem then come out to the de decoder okay for each encoder okay what is suppose you fix the encoder suppose you did some magic and forgot out <coughs> the best encoder that you could get okay for that encoder how many different decoders can you have what's the decoder anyway it's just a many to one mapping from 0 1 n to 0 1 k right how many different mappings can you have there <coughs> okay that's true but anyway let's so people are people are uh, being very smart about answering the question they are saying for a particular encoder you know already what the best decoder will be and why don't you go and do that okay we will come to that later supposing you didn't know about all this ml stuff okay just looking at this from numbers point of view i can assign it's not required to be one to one or anything so to each received word i can assign an arbitrary message i don't have to do anything else right do you agree all the messages should be mapped out to yeah maybe you want some constraint like that later on you can be smart about it but suppose being very dumb you see the number of the decoders is very huge okay so then design of the decoder also becomes very very crucial okay <coughs> right so so you have to select the list of code words 
and then you have to design an encoder for it and then for that chosen list of code words you will have to design the decoder okay so both of these you have to do to be able to come up with a good coding system uh, for your digital communication system is that clear <coughs> okay anything else that i'm missing out here okay all right so that's the very high level picture of what uh, what you have to do but but the next important and crucial question is is this even a good idea <coughs> right why would you want to do something like this okay your the justification i gave you was i can drive the probability of error to a very low number okay but what what is the price i have paid in doing that what price have i paid i'm sorry okay so i think a lot of people people know a lot of these things so you're giving more advanced answers okay at a very basic level the penalty you have paid number one penalties are first is complexity right from a very trivial system design point of view the complexity has gone through the roof right previously you could send one bit receive one bit and forget about the rest right <coughs> there's no problem now it has become much more complex that's one okay and other is the other thing which is more crucial in many systems is <coughs> is delay okay why why are we paying in terms of delay because we need all the we can exactly get all the n bits before exactly how to wait for n bit delay okay so the answer is you have to wait for <coughs> n bits before you can decode one bit okay so 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 even if you are transmitting at a very high rate that delay can be a bit of a problem okay so in many real communication systems you see delay is a problem but you can deal with it if it's tolerable you can deal with it several things will change in that time constant you just play around with it you can deal with delay also okay but complexity is one thing and the next price you pay is delay <coughs> okay but today i have to say with the advances in vlsi and all these things complexity is almost trivial you know i mean you can build huge uh, chips with lots of gates and lots of computations so complexity is okay delay is still an issue people are <coughs> people always fight to deal with it it can be dealt with it's not it's not an impossible issue but delay is an issue okay there is also a more crucial issue from a pure communication theory point of view or information theory point of view which is this redundancy that you are talking about okay <coughs> previously you used the channel once to attempt to communicate one bit now what's happening that's not what's happening what's happening you are you are using the channel n times to attempt to communicate only k bits okay you see why i am saying to attempt to communicate why am i saying to attempt to communicate errors yeah there are errors right so even the, even in the previous case though you attempted to communicate one bit in one channel use you were hardly ever getting one bit right you you will have a lot of errors okay so that's that's very important that's the uh rate penalty okay so what is the rate okay the rate we will define as k by n okay so typically if you are used to rates of kilobits per second megabits per second you have to read k by n very differently okay k by n is what it's the number of bits sent in one channel use okay that's the best way of thinking about it or if you want if you are very much a vlsi person you can say <coughs> k by n needs to be multiplied by the clock rate at which bits are being clocked into the channel before you get the actual data rate okay information data rate okay so this is this is very very fundamental okay so i'm going to try highlighting for for fun okay let's let's try a, let's try a green highlighting it's beautiful okay so that's very crucial okay so rate is is very 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 crucial okay so other two will will just simply wish it away we'll say we won't deal with it in this course but we will deal with the penalty that you want to pay so what's ideal ideally you would like the rate to be very very high okay so so that's that's something we will see okay so what have we gained what are what are our gains okay so i'm going to go to the next page to talk about our gains okay so the penalties we saw before what have we gained have we gained anything okay we don't know yet 
I am going to hope to show to you that we will gain in probability of error. Okay. Basically, that will be the <coughs> that will be the gain. Okay. Probability of error will go down much faster. Okay. When you do coding, as opposed to not doing coding. Okay. But there are a few other issues at the system level that you should be aware of. Okay. You will see eventually, hopefully after half the course, we will see this. Okay. You will see you will gain in transmit power. Okay. At same error rate. Okay. So, let me qualify this at same transmit power. Okay, you will get both these gains in a real system and it is and the and the first point might be very obvious to you, but the second point is very very crucial. Okay, in most real systems that is how it is really really used. Okay, so you can send a particular data rate at a lower transmit power. Okay, in most RF communication systems that are out there today, wireless <coughs> communication systems, what do you think is the most expensive part in the chain, the whole transmitting chain and receiving chain what is the most expensive part sorry the power amplifiers right power amplifiers are the most expensive parts in any <coughs> RF design okay why why is that so I think you have learnt enough electronics you should be able to answer that question why is why are the power amps so expensive so they have to be linear over a large power range okay so this bandwidth of these systems are also large okay those large bandwidth they have to be linear over a large power range okay so that's very very difficult to build it's not very easy to build those rf amplifiers it's very very expensive and if you go to somebody and say <coughs> it's enough if you design it design a power amp for 3 db lower it will sell it will save like i don't know crores of rupees okay it's a huge difference 3 db might seem like a small number to you it's a huge number for in those kind of ranges okay so it makes a big difference <coughs> real difference to systems okay so many people use coding to decrease the transmit power at the same error rate. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, as I said, based on information theory, it turns out you can decrease your transmit power by as much as 10 dB. Okay. If you say 10 dB, that is it. I mean, that is really, you bring down your costs by a huge amount. Okay. So, error control codes today play, play such a huge role in almost every communication system. Nobody really takes a system seriously unless there is coding in it. Okay. So, if you look at any one of your systems today, so I'll give you some practical examples. <coughs> I like giving two examples uh, usually just to drive home the point as to how, how, how useful error control codes are. Okay. So, 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 so let us see some examples. Okay. See, I am still having trouble with this. Okay, so the first example I usually give of a real system where coding you can see in your in your own experience it would have made a difference to you in, in a real system is the following. Okay. So so I, I do this in every every uh, coding class or uh, lecture I've given. Hopefully people have not seen this before. If you've seen this before, please be quiet. Okay, so what is this? Okay, there's nothing here. I have to draw one more. Okay. What is this? It's a very bad picture, but other than that, what do you think this is? Okay. Come on, man. You guys have to be creative. Tell me what that is. Okay, maybe I should make it more symmetric, huh? It's a bad looking picture. Let me draw it again. Okay. I think there is a way to draw nice circles in this, but I'm going to draw one circle and then there's a concentric circle around it. What does that remind you of? Stare at it for a while. Use your creativity. What is it? Think of it. I mean, it's an example of a digital communication. Something. I'm going to give you an example. Come on, man. Huh? Wow. There you go. <laughs> so it's never failed. You know. I mean, I've tried this five times so far. If somebody has guessed CD, okay. So I guess. That tells you. So that's the picture of a CD. Okay, I'm sure it's a better picture. <laughs> better pictures are out there. CD, DVD, whatever you want to think. Okay. So what's the for the system level? What's the issue? You would like to put, say, a movie. Okay. So some six-hour movie, if you want. You want to put that inside 
the CD converted into bits in some fashion, say some methods, and then you put it in there. Okay, but what happens when you use the CD in practice? You're going to get scratches. Okay, so roughly how to think of the way to think of bits on a CD are pit and no pit. Okay, so either a small hole that's a small hole that's dug in the on the surface or it's not there, and the laser is going to scan it, and then figure out where where there's a hole and where there's not, where there's a pit and where there's no pit. Okay, that's what it's going to do. And when there's a scratch, what happens? The whole pit, no pit thing goes away, right? <coughs> okay, so then you can't read it. Okay? So you see, situation like this, error control codes are play a very different kind of a role, which is interesting. Okay, so you might say, how does, how do these gains that I said, transmit power, probability of error, play into a situation like this? There's a much more basic role of, of that's played by error control codes. Okay? If you don't have error control codes on CDs, it would simply not work, right? Forget about transmit power, anything at all. Okay, it turns out all those things are also there in the CD. Okay, they gain on all that also, but on top of that, there is a very basic enabling device, right? Error control codes. Otherwise, you'll never do it. The moment there's a scratch, what will happen? You can't play your favorite movies on the DVD, right? How many of you have had CDs being rejected because it can't be read, right? Have you have you seen this situation? A CD will play in some drives, it won't play in some other drives. Okay, so all those things are cases where people have designed different things so that the SNR is just enough, SNR is not enough. All those things come into the picture. Okay, but <coughs> recovering from scratches is essentially because of because of error control codes. Okay. Okay. So think of the penalty you are paying here. Okay. So what's the penalty you are paying? You, you thought of rate there, right? So what would happen here? If I used a very low rate code, what would happen here? Space. Space, space. space becomes an important, right? Number of bits you can put per square inch. Okay, so you'll see the CD industry will define that as a big number. Number of information bits you can put per square inch. You'll see the actual coding that's done there is very low rate actually, but still information bits itself is quite large, okay? So, for instance, instead of if you think of a movie like Lagan or something, instead of putting it in one DVD, you will need probably some 10 DVDs if you, if you use a very low rate code, right? And that is a lot of money for, for somebody to buy, you cannot maintain it, so many problems are there, okay? So, there is a real advantage to that penalty being reducing that penalty, right? Having a rate as high as you want, okay? That is needed. But what is on the other side? If you use too high a rate, you will see later on, you will not get very good gains in probability of error. Okay, so, what happens if you use too high a rate? For instance, if you do uncoded storage, what happens? You cannot recover from any scratch. Okay, so, you, so, you can use the CD maybe once, twice, after that gone, can't use it. Okay, nobody will pay you for that also. Right? If you buy a CD or a DVD, how many years do you think it should last? Okay, forever? Okay, it won't last forever, believe me, but, but you would at least imagine 10 years, right? I mean, you don't want it to be thrown away before 10 years. Right? You <coughs> probably want to keep it in safe custody for 10 years at least, right? So 10 years should should be okay. Okay, that will mean you need to put enough redundancy there, but not too much. Right? So there's a trade-off. So in every system that uses error control codes, there will be this trade-off, and that's a real trade-off in terms of money. Right? It's not some artificial trade-off like I wrote down before in terms of rate and some probability of error. That's how we'll quantify it later on. But in the real world, it's a real trade-off which will make a big difference in money, okay? That is the first example. Second example I want to present is, okay, should I try the diagram again or no? <laughs> try it again, okay. So, here you go. Okay, you asked for it, okay? Cell phone, I, it's probably very easy. Uh, it's probably the easiest uh, thing that is out there. I think I did a better job drawing this than the CD, huh? Okay, good. <coughs> <laughs> so, what does a cell phone do? How is a, what does it do to, when you make a call, what, what's the other most important piece in the cellular system? The, the base station, right? So, you need the base station. So, okay, is that base station enough for you? I guess that's base station enough. Maybe I'll put a hash here, okay? So, that's base station and there's a link here, okay? So the channel here is a band of radio frequencies. It's not uh, it's not a wire <coughs> or, or anything else. It's a band of radio frequencies, and and you want to communicate, right? So there are there are several things to keep in mind in practice. For instance, 
most of what we do with the cell phone is what this voice right you speak and speech it turns out needs doesn't need very low bit error rates okay well it depends on what compression you but the compression they do in the cell phones requires bit error rate of 10 power minus 3 etc so it means you don't need a very strong code but, but still there is a code even when you speak your your voice is converted into bits right using some speech coder and then it is encoded with an error control code before it's transmitted doesn't go without coding <coughs> without coding it won't work but still you don't turns out you don't need okay but increasingly cell phones are also being used for data right for data you really need a low bit error rate at that time you need very strong coding and strong coding is these days being proposed for the new cellular standards also okay so let's go back to the trade off now okay let's not worry about the very latest and greatest in cellular communications i'm sure there are enough courses in definitely in this department which is talking about all those things let's talk about the coding trade off okay suppose i say in the communication from the cell phone to the base station okay there are two parameters right one is probability of error other was transmit power why is transmit power very crucial what do you think it will affect battery life right so it's so, so crucial if somebody sells you a battery for instance i think even today sony sony and motorola phones have a reputation of having very poor battery time so people won't buy this that's, that's a big problem okay so if you have <coughs> very if you have no coding if you have no coding if you have no coding at all right your transmit power is going to be really really huge and uh, you know it's not going to work but on the other hand what happens if you put very strong coding very very low rate very very low rate then what happens yeah then the, even then there could be some problems okay it's not very clear but you'll see, you'll see later on there could be some problems you can't just hold on to it for a long time because i think when you speak you you you're expecting to hear within a, i mean within the delay becomes a big problem you can't use a very long block length why will block length become large when rate becomes low k by n right the message bit is going to be the same the block length will start becoming very very large and if you put the rate too too low then the block length will become really large it will take a long time for it to go through and you will start hearing it will be like a overseas call so have you have had some overseas calls cheap calls you have to be confused when who is supposed to talk you don't know what's happening that's also not a good experience people won't do that talks okay so you see that this abstract trade off that we are going to study <coughs> in the next next uh, in the rest for the rest of this course between rate and probability of error okay is a very real trade off in terms of money in any digital communication system okay but this will be the absolute last time i ever mention or ever draw diagrams like this or mention anything close to a real system okay i'll never do that i'll al always be talking about rate probability of error only those things i'll be talking about okay you will have to make that connection later on okay so maybe maybe towards the very end i'll give you some examples and more more uh, <coughs> a better feel for uh, the straight off but just this this motivation for understanding uh, understanding what kind of real trade offs <coughs> coding can give you in a system okay any questions or comments at this point okay so if you did not believe error control codes existed out there as i said it's there in each cell phone okay and it's there in every cd driver you buy okay so every cd player every computer it ships out it's it's everywhere okay it's around all over the place every every system uses error control codes okay <coughs> all right so that's the that's all the background i wanted to give you let's jump into some some basics of codes okay i thought it's supposed to go to the next page okay managed to do it okay so so here's a, a brief look ahead at what the rest of the lecture today and and the next few days will be okay so we'll study what are called linear codes we'll begin with what are called linear codes okay and uh, well they'll be binary as well so let me just make it very specific we will study linear codes and then <coughs> after that we'll study uh, decoders okay so that's what we will do as we go along okay so i'll introduce 
one specific type of code okay i haven't told you what a code is okay a specific type of an encoder which will do only linear operations okay we'll study that first okay and we'll try to make some selection out of that we'll not really optimize too much but we'll make some selections for the encoder and then we'll study how to decode it okay it'll be a very simple specific examples and then we'll see in what way <coughs> in what way is this limited what it can give you what it cannot give you okay and then we'll see how to improve upon it okay so hopefully i think this one week will be enough to by friday i should be done with all this okay so so it's not it's not it's it's an old area in coding and uh, we'll go through this really fast okay all right so that's what we'll do in the next few lectures uh, there's one unfortunate part to this course isn't we don't have a really good text okay so so you're stuck okay so you either have to attend class take notes and follow up with these lectures online or or try to find some books in the library there are, some, there are several good books okay and uh, uh, so may, maybe i should maybe i should write down the names of some books right so let me do that so some books that you might want to pick up from some place okay <coughs> first one i would write down is a book i'll write down the author's name i think that should be enough for you chet blahut i believe the book is called algebraic codes for data transmission okay the title is algebraic codes for data transmission that's the book so my my lectures will be based on several books okay i'll write down all these books none of them are available in cheap indian edition okay if you are rich enough you can buy it from amazon or something paying the dollar rate or or if it's available in cheap edition let me know or it might be in your hostel land right so some one of those solutions might exist okay if they, if they exist then exploit it the second book is by lin and costello use the second edition okay so you need the second edition okay so that's uh, what's a good book and third book i've heard there's a book by ron roth okay this could be available in cheap edition i think i also heard that this book is a good book i, I didn't I haven't looked at it but i heard the approach is similar to something that i might be doing okay so these are books and there are other books also available out there and if you come across anything i mean bring it to me i'll i'll be i'll be glad to comment on uh, those books okay okay and then there's this grandest greatest books books of them all which is the book by florence mcwilliams and and uh, n j a sloan okay so i believe this book is like out of print you have to do a special order it's some 130 or something it's very expensive but it's a it's a very very good book okay all right so <clears throat> so i'll i'll encourage you to get a hold of one of these books if possible i mean and use that or maybe use some other book also but i, I would recommend <laughs> one of these four. okay so let's jump into linear codes okay so <coughs> i'll start by describing the encoder for a linear code and what it does and then we'll slowly proceed from there okay we'll see some examples maybe that's all we'll do in this class okay so very simple uh, very simple approach to the whole thing okay so as we said the encoder what does it have to do it has to take k bits in which i'm going to call the message vector m okay k okay, m with anything that i put down below this will make it a vector okay so in this case m would be what m0 m1 dot 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 till m k minus 1 okay that's the being awake text if i don't hear a k minus 1 then i'll have to do something else to wake all of you okay so that's k minus 1 what are each m i is 0 1 right it's just a bit okay <coughs> so k bits come in this is going to encode i'll simply call it encode now i'll just write down what it does below okay it puts out as i said n bits i'll say the code word c will actually be the message m and then to it it there'll be a vector p that's appended 
okay this is what i'm going to say the encoder is going to do <coughs> okay <coughs> my encoder for a linear code should do this i'm going to say okay it should take k bits right i'm going to call them m and it has to put out n bits which i'm going to call the code word c okay so what what do i mean when i write m and p next to each other they kind of concatenated put next to each other right how many bits is m k bits so what should p be n minus k bits okay so this is the message part of the code word this is the parity part of the code word okay and the parity part is n minus k bits <coughs> all right okay so you see we have made a very nice and simple uh, looking encoder which is at least nice to nice to present okay so what do you do when you actually implement an encoder like this the first k bits you can simply transmit as you receive it's exactly the same as the message and then after that you have to transmit n minus k other bits how do you do that is the encoding problem right the first k bits you know what to do after that for the n minus k bits you have to do this okay for a linear code the encoder Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's say the parity p is going to be p0, p1 to what? P and minus k minus 1. Okay. So that's my parity. Okay. I'm going to say for the linear code. Why did I say it's linear? Each pi is what? Is the XOR of several bits from from what? From M. I'm going to say. Okay. Right. So now we have come from 2 power n p 2 power k to some very simple encoding. So how many different ways can I do this? Let me see who's going to be the first to count this. I'm going to say you have to transmit the first k bits as it is what you receive. And then each parity bit can be an XOR of several each message k bits. So you'll have 2 power k into n minus k possibilities. Okay, so you see we have already reduced it by quite an amount. Okay. If you don't believe me, you can do some calculations in MATLAB and convince yourself this 2 power k into n minus k has a very good chance of being much much less than 2 power n c 2 power k or some such number okay so <coughs> think about why this is reduction okay at least you can see we are doing very some very small few possibilities for uh, each of these things okay all right <coughs> okay so that's what the encoder does i'm not going to worry about what the channel is going to do what the decoder is going to do we'll we'll see as we go along but this is what the encoder is going to do okay so a few things again rate is what rate is k by n okay so that's again that definition carries over i'm not going to change the definition here anything else i should mention here that's of importance i don't think uh, anything else is, is that important okay it's such a simple simple thing okay <coughs> so what we'll do is we'll we'll describe this in so many different ways refine it refine it refine it and get to a point where we are very happy that we understand the encoder really really well Okay, so we'll do that very fast and then we'll slowly move on and figure out what we really need to do to understand the decoder you see that will take more time it will require a little bit more effort but the encoder is quite simple enough okay so we'll begin by looking at an example okay so this example will carry over in most of our <coughs> most of our discussion okay so it's a very simple example but still it captures a lot of a uh, lot of what can happen in error control code okay so i'm going to say in my example, I'm going to pick k equals 3 and n equals 6. Okay, I'm going to send 3 bits in, I'm going to get 6 bits out. So, how many message and how many parity bits will be there in the code? Word? 3 and 3. Okay, 3 parity bits and 3 <coughs> message bits. Okay, so I'm going to say my p0 will be what shall I make it? I'll make it m0 plus m1. I'm going to say Okay, so keep this in mind. All my pluses will be modulo 2. Whenever I write a plus, it will be modulo 2. What is modulo 2 summation? It's the same as 
XOR. Binary XOR for binary. Okay. So I'm going to just I will I will in the future not write this. Okay, that will be implied in most terms. I'll simply write I'll simply write M0 plus M1. Okay, so in this equation, how will you write M0 in terms of P0 and M1? Yeah, you can write P0 plus M1. Okay, so you should be very comfortable with that. Minus 1 is the same as plus 1 modulo 2. Okay, XORing twice makes everything 0. <coughs> okay, so that's so that's, some, that's one thing it will be very clear, very clear. In the future when I write, there will be several places where you think there should be a minus, but it will all be plus. Okay, and 2 times anything will also become 0. Okay, that's my P0. Okay, then my P1 is going to be what shall I make it? M1 plus M2. Okay, and my P2 is going to be M4 plus M7. Okay, good. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's going to be M0 plus M2. Okay, seems like a very nice and symmetric thing to do. I had three bits to put out as parity. I just took all possible two combinations and put it out. Okay, so I want you to take. So now we, you remember the first the uh, uh, first discussion, right? All two par k possibilities exist for the message, and then only two par k out of two par n code words are there, right? You don't have no only two par k code words are there out of all two par n possibilities. I want you to make out a table where you have m on one side and m as one column and C as the other column and list it out. Okay, take take two minutes. I think it's a very well spent two minutes to write down M as one column and then C next to it. Okay, which is easy, M or C? Hmm. It must be. Suddenly you're asking. It must be is there? Okay. So, uh, no. C I wrote as M P. So M zero, M one, M two. M I wrote as M zero, M one, M two. No. Left to right always. Okay, so what part of C is easy to write? M or P again? M, no, so it's very easy. Simply write 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1
okay in most cases the code code will be chosen carefully okay so in our example what is the code okay if we call the code c the example code c is what okay i have to list it out right 0000000001011 dot 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 you saw it in the column till 111000 so what's the size of my code what's the size of any set the number of elements in it right so the size of the code is what 2 power k in which case it's 8 okay that is the code okay <clears throat> all right so now i have about 10 minutes left so i'm going to try and write the same encoding process in various different ways okay so i'm going to write it in two different ways okay it's the same exact encoding process i did and then we'll generalize from there okay so right now we simply say message and then you make some combinations to get parity it's not clear what the set that we get is the set of code words we get it's not clear what it is okay so we're not able to quickly see any wonderful properties for that set right so we, we just we're just thinking about it but the, it turns out one property we could see was what 000000 will be there that's the only thing we could see we couldn't see anything that's more non trivial maybe maybe some of you can but it's not very immediate we'll see if we interpret it using these other ways of writing it down see some more wonderful properties will follow okay so the first way of writing down the encoding process in a different way is using this notion of a generator matrix okay okay so what am i given in the encoder if you go back to the previous picture i'm given k and n and then i'm i, I will have to tell you how i do this xor what bits bits of m or xor to get a particular pa if i do that i completely describe the encoder so i'm going to just capture all that information into a matrix form i'm going to say i'm i'll write the code word c okay as m times a matrix g okay i'll use capital letters for matrices without any underlining okay so you have to understand that capital letters are matrices typically without any underlining the capital letters can also be sets okay the difference will be clear i hope okay so i won't multiply a vector by a set okay at least not in this class okay so so for this equation to be true what should what type of a matrix should g be okay well first it has to be a binary matrix right i mean so the way we did it everything is binary <coughs> you are doing all mod 2 so it should be a binary matrix and then it should be size k by n right because m is a 1 by k matrix so to get a 1 by n matrix out multiplying with g on the right k should be g should be a k by n matrix so you see immediately g is a k by n matrix okay then is it really possible can i really write c as m times g okay i'll show you how to write for the example and then from there it will be clear what you would do for the general case okay it's obvious c says it's obvious <laughs> well it is obvious i want to just drive home the point a little bit it, it's very clear it's very very easy for the example at least it's very very easy okay so for the example i can write c equals m which is what i'll, I'll expand m for now m0 m1 m2 and then i have to multiply on the right with g right what will i put here for g okay well the first bit of c is what m0 m0 itself okay so you see the first column of g should be 100 okay so why do why am i looking suddenly for the first bit of c why did i look at the first column of g okay if you should know that much about the basics of linear algebra right when, when you multiply with the matrix on the right each entry is simply a linear combination of the each column of g right so that's the important thing so you see the first column is simply 1 0 0 what's the second column 0 1 0 what's the third column 0 0 1 likewise now you see you can quickly write even the fourth column right what's the fourth column it has to give you the first parity bit how did i find the first parity bit m0 plus m1 so it should be 1 1 0 okay and what will p1 be 
I think I did 0 1 1 ok 0 1 1 and then P 2 was 1 0 1 ok. So, if you think about this for a while you will see for any linear encoder any description I give you I can definitely write it in this form you can write C equals M times G ok convince yourself that you can right how do you do it the first first K by K part will be what identity, identity itself and then there will be a K by n minus k part which will be defined by the actual XOR cited column wise ok. So, now you can go back and look at his answer why did he say 2 power k times n minus k <coughs> in this matrix what can you pick and what can you not pick the identity is given to you you can only pick the, the parity part and there are k times n minus k bits there. So, obviously there are 2 power k times n minus k ways of choosing it. So, you see just by doing this simple transition to a generator matrix you are able to answer this question like how many encoders will there be in a very easy fashion without having to resort to some well I do not know if he resorted to fancy counting but at least something that looked unobvious initially when he gave the answer ok right when, when you wrote it down in this matrix form you see immediately there are wonderful results like this are just coming out very easily ok. So, you see this at least aids in some simple counting we will see it aids in so many other ways we will see that as we go along ok. So, in general this is true any any encoder that I described before can be written in this form as a matrix multiplication on the right. The first k by k part will be an identity part the next part will be a parity part ok. So, this form is called the systematic form for the generator matrix ok. So, if you have seen this before this form in which you have an identity here is called the systematic form ok. Okay. <coughs> okay, so I think I'm very close to finishing time. So I'll stop here. We'll pick up from here in the next class, right at this point, and then I'll describe the generator matrix. And you see, so far we've been looking at co columns of the generator matrix. Suddenly, in, if you rewrite this term, you'll see the rows of the generator matrix mean more to the code than the columns of the generator matrix. Okay, so what do you think the rows of the generator matrix will be? They are the code words. Yeah, the code words. They'll form a basis for your code the code will be a linear subspace all those things you will see immediately if you look at the row picture in the next uh, class ok. Thanks we will see we will meet again at 11 o'clock tomorrow right ok.